Well, here we are again for Wednesday night Bible study back in the book of Hebrews. So before we begin, let's uh, start with a word of prayer. <laughs> let's pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the beauty of the night, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that you gave us the time, the will to be here in your house, Lord, to Look into your word and have your word look back into each and every one of us, Lord, to, pre- to provide, Lord, uh, the things that we would need, Lord, to be more like Jesus when we leave this place tonight than when we came. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, we begin uh, again in the book of Hebrews uh, for the, seems to be the, the 10th or 12th time. We're now, now only in the 6th chapter of about 13 chapters, and so uh, your pain is just about halfway over. Um, in, in regard to continuing our lesson last week, last week I pointed out that there were some couplets of phrases and words that were in the verses 4 through 6 in Hebrews and that we would begin to look at each one of them. Last week we looked at the first one. This week we begin to look at the second one. And this week when I start, I want to start with a few stories that I think will help bring out a principle that's applicable to this passage. And so we'll begin with the story first and then we'll talk about the stories and the principles that we might be able to draw from the stories. And these are real life stories. Taken right off the number one source for all truth and fact, factual information. The internet. Okay. That's right. Facebook. Right. Instagram. Story number one. James is a young highland cow. That's C-O-W. No pun intended. Just straight talk here. That lives on a farm in Asheville, North Carolina. But he's no ordinary cow. James fancies himself a dog. A cattle owner or cattle owners, Emily and Adam, believe James suffered brain damage at birth. He also suffered an early life infection. And so for several weeks, he lived inside the couple's home with their dogs. Once James grew too big for the home, tells you kind of how long the cow was there, he moved into the couple's backyard with their chickens but he still prefers the company of his canine friends. Story number one. Story number two. Story number two. Cal, here's the headlines. Cal thinks she's a dog. Betsy is, fu- is a fuzzy cow and runs around the yard and plays with the family dog and begs for treats like a big puppy. You can bet that Betsy keeps up with all of her uh, adorable adventures on her own Instagram page. You can look her up at Fidu Do Puppy Cow on Instagram or at Puppy Cow on Instagram. Also has a website that's uh, HTTP Fidu Do Puppy Cow. Story number three. Now, this is, this, listen a little bit closer on this. Now, this is an ABC news story. I mean, the ABC news story by Avante Tan on November 5, 2015, so it's a few years back, Goliath, who's actually a small calf, was rescued a few months ago from a dairy farm that was planning on slaughtering him, according to Shaley Hubbs, a high school senior who lives with her family on a ranch in Danville, California. Though Goliath was so weak and so small that he could not stand and you could pick him up very easily, therefore. The family got him and now has nursed him into a eight-week-old healthy calf, Hub said to ABC News Today. The only thing that he doesn't, this is says, the only thing that he doesn't think is that he's a cow. I'm pretty sure he thinks he's a dog, said Hubs, age 17. We raised him with our three dogs and he's around them every day. They chase and they play together. He watches how they eat dog food and drink water and eats from their dog food bowls and drinks their water and copies them in every detail. He sleeps and lays in the dog's beds. He loves scratches along his neck, nose, and ear. Most recently, Goliath learned how to get into the house and sit on the couch thanks to Hub's sneaky two-year-old great dame named Leonidas. He's best friends with Leo, and so he watched Leo push the door handle down and come, on, come in the house and sit down on the couch. And, of course, he followed suit. 
And now he knows how to come in and he just pushes down the knob, lets himself in and onto our couch. He goes on and says, he says, he goes on and says, as Goliath became more active, he even tried to nurse with little Leo, thinking that Leo was his mother, Hubbs said. Hubbs said she, she and her family enjoyed the attention of Goliath it is getting. He said he's the beloved family pet these days, and he's here on the ranch where he'll stay with several horses, sheep, goats, and, of course, Leonidas. So, you're thinking other than just being silly, maybe trying to be funny, that these stories are not related to Hebrews chapter 6. But let me begin by asking a few questions. So what are you just general impression of these stories? So what do you think? Are any of these cows in actuality dogs? Do you think that the cows think that they're dogs? Do you think that the cows think that they're dogs? That's a pretty good thought. Yeah. You know, self-awareness is something that only a few animal species on this planet have. Even the greatest and the highest level of intelligence of subhuman life, the great apes and chimps, there's only a few varieties of those that even have self-awareness. And so to have cognitive thought of self-recognition or self-identification with another one that's like them is even more difficult. Well, do you believe... Uh, that uh, since you believe that these uh, cows aren't dogs, let me ask you, why aren't they dogs? They s do the things dogs do. They, you know, hang out with dogs. Why aren't they dogs? Okay. Genetically, they're not dogs, okay. What what were you gonna say, Eric? Okay, all right. You know, just because a turkey hangs around the eagles doesn't make a turkey eagle, does it? So if these cows are not dogs, but if their behavior seems to be a product that would be like dogs, we're saying that that still doesn't make them a dog, right? Even if their behavior mimics or is model after dogs, that still doesn't make a cow a dog. Now let's get down to brass tacks. What's the principle? We've already talked all over it. Your, your environment doesn't make you what your environment is, or those in the environment around you. Just like a turkey doesn't become an eagle because he hangs out in a turkey, you know, in, in an eagle's nest, or just because you put an eagle on a turkey farm doesn't make the eagle a turkey, and if things don't happen like that, then let me ask you these questions. Does a church, does a person that goes to church necessarily, does going to church make them a Christian? Okay. Does being raised in a Christian home with Christian parents make a child a Christian? Does being a member of a church make you a Christian? Does being baptized make you a Christian? But if all of these things are in place, why wouldn't you be a Christian? Wouldn't your neighbors, if they saw all these things of you, assume that you're a Christian? Possibly. Yeah, that's right. That's right. The, Leanne used a, 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 a very crucial word there, the assumption. The word that I chose just two weeks ago was presumption, remember? Th that you're being presumptive, drawing the conclusion that association with a certain group makes you that which you associate with. So how, how, how many ever remember the, the movie Steve Martin was in called, what was it, The Jerk? White guy raised by a black family didn't have no rhythm. Yeah. How about White Man Can't Jump? You know, Woody Harrelson, you know. It just it just some stereotypes there. Those movies had some stereotypes that just they showed that just because you hang out or just because you were raised by it doesn't make you that. And so if we can agree that 
hang, a dog that a cow that hangs out with a bunch of dogs doesn't make the cow a dog. And if we can you know, agree that just hanging out at church and doing churchy kind of things doesn't make a person necessarily a Christian, you know, then we have to step back and look at this passage and, and understand this passage in light of certain assumptions that we've made here, certain principles that we've drawn. And I believe that's very helpful in this. I, I wrote these down in my notes, and I want to say this, and I'll try to read this around uh, very, very carefully here to make sure that I don't get crossed up. It says, if as I and others contend, these five expressions in verses 4, 5, and 6 describe those who cannot be saved, we need to consider how it is that experience might fool someone into believing a false belief or a shallow belief that they are indeed saved. That is to say, hanging around and doing Christian things is not the same as being a bona fide Christian. Let's look at the second characteristic tonight. The first was they were enlightened, which we basically can summarize by saying this, they obtained a certain level of knowledge. This week, we look at the second expression, and we want to consider verse 4, two-thirds of verse 4, and particularly the center part of verse 4 in Hebrews chapter 6. We'll begin to read all the way through the phrase that we want to end on tonight. For in the case of those who have once been enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift. And we remember that in verse 7, it talks about these things here. It is impossible to renew them to repentance because they crucify Christ again and put him to an open shame. Just like we did last week, we took that phrase, for in the case of those who have once been enlightened, it is impossible to renew them once again to repentance because they put Christ to an open shame. Da, 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 da. And so that's where we have tonight. So tonight we notice the connective and between these two phrases, between enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift so let me ask you what in the world is the author talking about when he uses the phrase have tasted the of the heavenly gift or the, tasted the heavenly gift what is he talking about Okay, what Clegi is talking about, he's talking about the doctrine that, that the church calls common grace. He's talking about common grace. Uh, the scriptures tell us that he, he, it rains on the just and the unjust alike, right? And so we think of the rain as being a symbol of calamity and peril and woes. But also, on the other hand, don't unsaved, unregenerate people who may have you known have passed away without Christ? Didn't they have children? Didn't they have a life? Didn't they have family? And the scripture tells us that blessed is the womb that bears the son. Best, blessed is the man whose quiver is full of children. The quiver meaning like arrows. He shoots them off into the world. You know, It, it says that in, in Proverbs, it says that you know, a, a man who has many grandchildren you know, is blessed or happy. And so common grace says that, you know, you're given life, you're given family, you're given, you know, all these different things, just like those who are going to heaven, those who will perish in eternal damnation also enjoy many of those very same things. So that's what Cleegy's talking about. So when it talks about uh, of the tasted, having tasted of the heavenly gift or have tasted of the heavenly gift, depending upon what your translation says, that's a possibility. We'll get a little bit more down to the nuts and bolts of what that might be a little bit later. What else might it be? Okay. 
So Leanne said that she's hearkening back to the previous statement because remember there's a connective of the and there. Those who are enlightened have attained a certain level of knowledge. And what was a certain level of knowledge? Remember what MacArthur said? I quoted MacArthur this past week. He says, when the Word of God and the Holy Spirit of God come together, then regeneration can occur. But one without the other, it's not altogether in a package. And so she's, she's right in the respect that when it says, have tasted of the heavenly gift, it very well could be that you're blessed to know the things that you would know about God, and that can include two things. She mentioned something very specific, but it could be general. And so in, in the church, there's the doctrine of general revelation. So uh, Psalm 19.1, for example, says, the heavens declare the glory of God. And, and this whole thing, the, the firmament is used in the King James. It says, you know, and, and the, the firmament declares God. It says, night after night, he pour, it pour forth speech, meaning the creation. It's speaking about God. And you go talk to astrophysicists and cosmologists and, you know, molecular biologists, and they go down to the levels that they're at in their professions, and they look at it, and they look at that thing, and many times that drives them to God. Or at least there has to be some cause, some initial cause to cause all of this to come to be. So there's general revelation. What Leanne spoke about was called special revelation. So when God works in a special way to reveal himself, and so like in the Old Testament days at the beginning in Hebrews, it said that God in the old times, in the old days, revealed himself through what? Dreams and through prophets. And things of that nature. And so there's special revelation. So you, you can think of special revelation in several senses. Even the lost people at times will encounter special revelation. That's the whole purpose of Israel. Was to be a special beacon, a special light to all the peoples that they had in contact. Uh, would come in contact with. And from the time that they left uh, their bondage in Egypt, Egypt. Weren't they known to be coming? from where they were coming and known to be going where they were going and didn't Rahab says we knew you were coming and our hearts melted in us and all the courage fled away from us that's a part of special revelation it's not the gospel in its totality but it is special because it's manifest right there to a particular group of people another special revelation would be how about the prophet Jonah going to Nineveh to preach what did he preach repent God's upset with you what God <laughs> You know, my God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's special revelation. And so she's right when Leanne says it could be very well, meaning having tasted of the heavenly gift, it could be the most potentially profitable gift is to receive what? The gospel. I say potentially because you don't ever take for granted that it's going to be accepted because Obviously, I believe there's enough of us here tonight that can testify that we know some people that have passed on who've passed up the heavenly gift if it is indeed the gospel. They perished without Jesus. So, what else might it be? Take that thought just a little bit further. How about Jesus as Savior and as Lord? That would seem to be like the gift of all gifts is to have him as your savior. Remember also that Jesus said twice, both in the Sermon on the Mount and in Luke's recording of the Sermon on the Mount, he said it two different times. He says, your father who is in heaven gives only good gifts to his children, right? And he says, and if you ask, how much more would he not give the Holy Spirit, number one, and on the, other hand, on, on the other hand, in Matthew's gospel, he says, give good things to they that ask him. So it could, be all, it could be a lot of these things. Unfortunately, this phrase is only used one time in the New Testament. Having tasted of the or the heavenly gift. And that makes it very difficult for us to nail down what that is. I think we can eliminate some things as we go along as if we understand the phrase a little bit better. 
but it's possible that some of these could fit into that definition of what it meant by tasted of the heavenly gift, as the New American Standard says. So, any other thoughts on what this gift might be? Because that's what we're talking about right now, is what the gift might be. Just throw it up on the board. It'll stick. Leanne said two wonderful things in what she was saying there. She made an allusion uh, in what she was saying. She talked about spiritual gifts in one, one part of that. But she also talked about the, the actual calling, the effectual calling, as it's called, of the Holy Spirit in the inner man and the inner woman. And there's certainly a truth to both of those things that... it. We, I quote John 6, all the time. No one comes to the Father except he be drawn. And who does that work? That's the work of the Holy Spirit. And in, in, in the old King James lingo, it says that you know, it uses the word quicken. And that's not a programming software that does taxes, okay? It, it meant in the old vernacular is to bring something to life. What were we talking about this weekend? This past weekend, we were talking about regeneration bringing something to life or bringing life in there. And so that's a very good point. That's a very, that's a very good place to be thinking about this thing. In tandem with the conjunction and and being enlightened, again, the word without the Holy Spirit, it's not going to be profitable. The Holy Spirit without the word, that's not going to be profitable. And so if you've got knowledge, which necessarily would have to be conveyed in word, okay, then you have possibility this next gift that's talking about and she's right to note that this is a singular this is in the singular both in the greek and the english and so it's not talking about gifts so it's not talking necessarily about spiritual gifts because there's there's none of those that are specifically mentioned and it's probably not talking about jesus as savior you know if you think about it that looks like it's putting the cart before the horse but that's how a lot of people will read this, is that this being enlightened and having tasted of the heavenly gift is salvation through Jesus Christ. That's how many people read that phrase. So let's just look at the words. Let's start with the first word, tasted. Tasted. How many of you go to a, how many of you ever gone to a buffet, for example, and you went to the buffet and you didn't, you didn't know exactly what everything was on there or didn't know if you would like it, and so what did you do? You got a whole plate of it, right? So you say, what's these little things over here called chitlins? And so you got a whole bunch of them, right? So you got a little tiny bit of it, and what do you do? Do you eat it? Do you eat it? Might smell it, might look at it, might examine it, might sample it and taste it and see what it's like that's something close to what the word means here that's something real close to what the word means here uh, this is from the greek verb that means to eat or taste that's the root and in the new testament it appears 15 times frequently it's in the connection of the phrase listen to this taste death now let me ask you something do you taste death or do you experience death? Do you taste death? You see, now you get to the nuance of what the word is. When you say, I, I tasted Rocky Road ice cream, you know, that's one thing. You understand what I'm talking about, right? But when you say, 
he tasted death, you're not saying that he literally tasted something, an object called death, is he? He experienced it, right? And so the word is typically used in this idea of to taste death, for example. And so if we take this word now with this understanding to our mind, it seems that we could add a little shade or a nuance to the meaning of taste of the heavenly gift. We might be able to substitute a word to experience or experienced of the heavenly gift. Does that make a difference? It makes a world of difference. It makes a world of difference. It makes a world of difference. It's not literally like something that you've taken in and it's become a part of you like your food. It's an experience more so than anything else. Uh, another lexicon of the Greek says it, this includes the idea of tasting as in the experience of an activity or of a cognitive experience of coming to know something or something. See how that builds on that idea of experience? You might say that in, 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 in one way it would be very odd in our language to say this, but you could say that the disciples tasted Jesus. They had an intimate experience with Jesus. And this word, it would be weird as it's translated in English, but the Greek, you could probably say that. That they experienced Jesus. As a matter of fact, didn't the, didn't the disciples, was it John? Yeah, it was John. It says that these things that we've seen and that we've held and that we touch with our hands, we're, we're telling you. He's, what's he saying? These things that we've personally seen and experienced. And that's what this word means. It says this, thus, as the word was used at the time of its writing. That's very important. You know what it is when you take today's understanding of words or culture and you superimpose it upon culture that's two, three, four, six hundred, seven hundred, two thousand years ago? That's called being anachronistic. You're applying today's words and meanings and standards to things way back in the past. And you can, you can thank my Western Civ uh, college teacher in Western Civ for that because she was always one to quickly uh, shut down the criticisms of the youth today about what happened in the past, saying you're being very anachronistic. And they would go, what? And that was one of the few words that them 19-year-olds didn't know. And she would explain to him, you're taking today's cultural norms and mores and sensibilities and applying it to a culture that's foreign to those concepts that might not even have them developed. And so that's applying today's standards to something. And so the writer here in this lexicon, which is a dictionary, that means dictionary for academics, lexicon, they use just different words. It says, the word was used at the time for writing, at the writing of the time of this document it expands on the former statement of these folks are being enlightened or have been enlightened. They went from purely going into the academic, basically like a, a, a pupil in college. They just learn, right? They, they retain info. But then when they get out into the real world, that's when experience begins, right? And so you can learn what an accountant does or how to do accountantly things, right? But then... Over here, when you leave school, then you're expected to go out and be what you've learned. And a lot of times what that means is that you go into either apprenticeships or internships. Sometimes that internship or apprenticeship is during your schooling. So when you hit the road from school, you've actually got some experience. Like the great philosopher from NASCAR Hall of Fame said, Daryl Waltrip says, nothing beats experience. Right, So, the word means, and it builds on this idea of a pure accumulated uh, knowledge base to the experience and application of that knowledge. And so it is. It is tied directly back to the prior statement. Not only because it's there with a the conjunction and, but the two words enlighten what it means and, and this word being tasted fit together like a glove. Also, this is something else that is, is interesting about this word. Like we got into a little bit of grammar last week, uh, last Sunday, 
this verb is in the middle voice. And what that means is that it's a cooperative effort. It's a cooperative effort on the person who receives the action of the verb from someone or something else to perform that action themselves. And so we would say that when a student goes to college, they have to cooperate with their professors in order to learn, do they not? They have to listen, they have to engage, they have to take notes, they have to study, right? Most of us do. And so you could say that their learning process was like in the Greek middle voice. It was a participation in something, some action of the professor by the student and also the professor, correct? So that's an idea or a picture of the Greek middle voice. And so this verb is in the middle voice, uh, but also it's in the past tense. And so he's, the writer is talking about something that had happened in their past. They had accumulated some knowledge and they had had an experience. That's, that's like Dr. Bennett used to say, don't, don't come into my office and don't come into my counseling. And, I, and he, he would ask, Are you, do you know that you know that you know that you're going to heaven? And you point back to this time, way back here when you walked the aisle of Ebenezer Baptist Church and you got dunked in the tank two weeks later. Because what did we say last week? John 3.16 says, He who is believing on Him. It's an active faith. It's an active belief. It's not a past tense event only. It's a past tense event in the moment that you make that proclamation, that declaration, and that confession. But it's an ongoing recommitment to that same confession and profession day by day by day, minute by minute by minute. And so the author is referencing them back back here and, and it's getting to this idea that, hey, look, you know, we, we know that you had an experience. We know that you had some knowledge. And so just be careful. And so let's go on as we talk about this thing uh, a little bit deeper here. Let's talk about that gift of the heavenly gift. As I said already, it, it only appears once in the scriptures. And, and what we really like to do when we go and do interpretation in the scripture is go to find out how that word or that phrase is used in several different places and we get an idea of its scope and how it's used. That's called semantics. You ever, you ever say, everybody said you're just playing semantics? You know, you change the meaning of the word by how you want it to, to come out? That's what they mean when you say, oh, you're just playing semantics. You're using the word in as many ways that it can be used to mean what you want it to mean, probably to win an argument against somebody else that's using the word in a different way. And they say, oh, you're just playing semantics. And so it's hard for us to say what this phrase literally and concretely means because there's no other definition or example that would give us any type of description of what's going on there. So how do we, how do we, how do we deal with that? Well, the phrase is literally, if I remember right, it's four words in the Greek. And so the first word, the word that we want to concentrate on is gift. The first word is gift. And for example, uh, we, we could say this uh, here. Uh, it indicates uh, that this is the gift. You see that? It says the gift of the gift. That's the definite article. And so it might mean that definite article might put it in a class of its own. That's like saying the difference between having the chocolate and a chocolate. You know, those of you, those of you who are chocolate lovers, you probably have a particular brand or anything else that you might put in that category. And so you could say that the definite article might give it a certain status of being the supreme type of gift. And that's where we get into the connotations of being uh, we have this uh, adjective called heavenly. That's the adjective that's in the, in the sentence there. And so the adjective heavenly is describing this gift. And we would think that whatever is of heavenly nature would be sublime and perfect, right? And it might be the, the heavenly gift. It might be the gift. Literally, the way it says in the text is of the, the gift, heavenly. That's literally what it says. So it has its own definite article for gift. And so that helps us to understand that this is a unique gift as opposed to any generic gift or one of many gifts. 
the, also the, the word in the Greek has a, a particular idea or connotation with it. If I use the word gratuitous, what would you think that I would be talking about? Think the word gratitude. Okay, it's, in this, it's from the same Latin as gratitude. And so we would say that let's just talk about it in the problem of evil. You know, if there were just a little bit of evil in the world, we'd be all okay with that. But when there's gratuitous evil, it's awful hard for us to see that there's a God and that he's a loving God, that he's just. And what gratuitous is being used for there is to say the super abundance of evil. The overwhelming majority of instances seem to be evil. And what it is in, in the instances that we see of it are so heinous. And so this word here, meaning gift, also has an emphasis on the gratuitous nature or character of the gift. Meaning that whatever this gift is, if it is of heavenly origin, we would think it would be positive. We would think it would be supreme, that it would be superlative. And the emphasis on the nature of the gift that's being spoken about here is that it is of the most sublime, the most uh, uh, lavish gift. As a matter of fact, that word lavish is used in some of your translations. Did you realize that? Search, search in your electronic Bibles as you're sitting right there for the word lavish and see if it's in there. Nobody have it in there? Yeah. Okay. Who's the he there? That Solomon or David? I think it's talking about David at First Kings nineteen. So what he's talking about, he has lavished. It means that he made a super abundant offering. There. It's also in Isaiah chapter twenty five verse six, where it says, "The Lord of hosts will prepare a lavish banquet for all the peoples on his mountain." a banquet of aged wine and choice pieces of marrow and refined aged wine. It's also in Isaiah 46, 6, where it says, those who lavish gold from the purse and weigh silver on the scale hire a goldsmith and he makes it into a god and they bow down to it. So two instances there in Isaiah, one's negative and positive. One talks about how God is going to treat people with a, a super abundance overwhelming blessing of this banquet and then the other is God condemning the people for how they lavish their wealth and they give it to a God that is not a God so there's positive and negative there uh, when we when we have uh, uh, different uh, translations you can find that word in different places where you won't find it in others and so if you don't see it in Isaiah there like that don't don't be don't be uh, surprised by that. So, First uh, John three one in the NIV says this, and this is this goes along with our text. It says, "See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God, and that that is what we are, meaning children of God." It says, the reason the world does not know us is that they did not know Him. 
So there, there it is in the NIV in 1 John 3.1. And so when we talk about this definition of this word gift, it's not an ordinary gift. It's not an ordinary gift. It's already attached to the adjective heavenly, which gives it this idea of being special as from above. It's always, it already has the definite article attached to the word itself, separate from the word itself, but it goes with the word itself. And so it's not a gift, but the gift, or the gift, depending upon how you want to pronounce it. And now, just in the connotation of how it's used in the New Testament grammar and the semantics, it's an extraordinary, uh, superabundant, uh, lavishing of something upon whoever the recipient is. So we see that this thing is something um, extraordinary at the very least. And so what that might be, we're not told specifically. But in the context of what we're reading, remember, he's the verb, the main verb in this whole paragraph, this whole three, three verse paragraph here is they cannot be renewed can't be renewed and he's describing the ones that can't be renewed it's the ones who've received this information it's the one who's received this gift and this gift is an experiential gift so they experience something about what they have been taught about and yet they've refused to commit like leanne said themselves to what they've learned and what they've experienced these are the ones that can't be renewed to repentance that doesn't sound like me or you that are practicing John 3.16. He who is believing shall have eternal life. That sounds like somebody that's in the center group from MacArthur. Remember what he said? Jews that stayed a Jew were going to be a Jew. The, the Jews that had converted to Christianity and they were making ways and headrows and they were growing. And now the center group was the ones that had the information. They had been enlightened. Doesn't mean saved. It's not a synonym for saved. And they had an experience. They went to church, let's just say. Uh, they, they had maybe even a Christian father or mother. Maybe they were the second generation. Remember, this letter was written probably somewhere in the 60s. And so Jesus went to heaven around 33 A.D. So there's approximately 30 years there. So there were probably second generation Christians that are being written here. They're experiencing, you know, uh, a crisis of faith. Many of these people. Then the ones that are there, they might be guilty of presumption. Remember, if I hang out with a dog, I might be a dog, right? You know what mom used to say about hanging out with the dogs? You'll get up with fleas. <laughs> Didn't make me a dog, but sure did give me fleas, right? And I think that's what we have here in here. So the gift might very well be the enlightenment that comes through the knowledge and the experience of the Holy Spirit. It might include hearing the gospel from men. It might be coming from the quickening and the calling of the person of the Holy Spirit to give them to take literally the blinders off their eyes of their heart that they would be able to see the truth of the gospel. What better gift? than to have God intervene in one's life that they would be able to see the truth of the gospel. And so they're not regenerate in the sense that they're saved, but they could be regenerate in the sense that, that, that the sin that they were born with, the sinful nature they were born with, has been set aside that they would see the truth. And it also seems to go along with John 3, 18 and 19, I think it is, where it says that it's not... It's not the purpose of God to come into the world to condemn it. The ones that are condemned are the ones that fail to believe in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And why would God hold a, a person who's incapable of believing culpable of disbelief? Except that He Himself ensured that they're able to believe yet lack the ability in their own self to decide to follow. See, that's always, that's always the sticky wicked between the Arminianist and, and the Calvinist. The hardcore Calvinist says that God elects them. 
He chooses them before the foundation of the world. He seals them. He saves them. And they don't know who they are many times. And they don't have a choice about it. That's a sticky, that's a sticky proposition. Then how do you hold somebody over here guilty of disbelief in God? If you don't even enable them to believe. You see, that's the sticky point in there. And so there's a middle road between the Calvinist and the Arminius. You know, you know, Amaraldianism is you take some of this and you take some of that and you, you bring it together. And that's probably where I would land in the whole theological spectrum as being maybe a three point Calvinist as opposed to a five point Calvinist. Because I don't believe that grace is so irresistible that you can't refuse it. And I, I believe that God's effectual call is not a command, but an offer. You know, he didn't say that every, every person who comes to him is commanded to come, and thus he comes. He says every person who comes to the Father is drawn. And it's almost the picture, if you think about it, since we're talking about cows, you know, how many of you have ever dealt with cows before? If a cow don't want to move and it's a full-grown cow, you ain't going to move it by yourself. You can put a bridle on it. You can put a rope on it. You can put a prod in it. You can do lots of things to make that cow move. But you by yourself with simple tools aren't going to make a full-grown cow move. You can only draw the cow. And how do you do that? You tease it with food many times, don't you? You get some hay or you get some feed. And you draw that cow along. Or then you go get a horse and you can become a wrangler. But the whole point of this is, is that when we read this verse here, when it says, for in the case of those who have once been enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away, who are those people that he's talking about? Is he talking about the regenerate and the saved, which I don't believe that's the case? Or is he talking about the ones that merely are riding the fence? And it seems to me it's a whole lot easier to put that group under these crosshairs than it would be uh, pro more problematic to put the, the saved on the fence right here and start poking arrows at them or throwing arrows at them. And that's precisely what uh, MacArthur brings out to us. I want to read to you one thing here that Kenneth Weiss says, and, and we'll close down here real shortly, about this phrase. Weiss was a, a scholar, uh, a Greek scholar, and also a, an interpreter uh, of the New Testament. He lived between 1893 and 1962. And that's when you had to do your work by hand and with pencil, and when you really had to know your stuff. You didn't look it up on the Internet and like me. And so I'm... I'm using some stuff, some study that's old. It says, They tasted of the heavenly gift and in such a way as to give them a distinct impression of its character and quality. For the words once for all qualify the word also. These Hebrews were like the spies in Kadesh Barnea who saw the land and had the fruit in their very hands. Yet what did they do? They turned back. What they saw wasn't upheld by their faith, was it? The Lord said that he would give them the land. They just had to go possess it, right? The Lord said he would go in before them and dispossess the inhabitants. They had to go in and possess the land. But what did the spies think? They saw the big people, right? They saw the fortified cities. And they thought their job was to go fight the people in fortified cities. God said, go possess the land. And nowhere did he ever say, fight the people. God says, I will drive them out like hornets. I will drive them out. But their faith was non-existent. That was my editorial comment. Back to Weist. He says, one of the pre-salvation ministries of the Spirit is to enable the unsaved to come under the hearing of the gospel, to have a certain appreciation for the blessedness of salvation. Then he equips them with a spiritual sense and a taste uh, to the reference uh, for the things of God. Many a sinner has been, these are old words now, many a sinner has been buoyed up by the message of the evangelist, has had stirrings in his bosom, and had the pleasant reaction towards the word of truth, and yet, 
when decision time came, has said, this world is too much for us and has turned back into sin. That's just like the seed that said it was cast on the side of the road and it sprang up, or, or the rocks, I don't remember which one it was, whether it was on the side of the road or rocks. And it says, man, it sprouted up real sudden. And then when the cares of the world came, it withered and died. It came up, but it withered and died. That's what Weiss is saying here about the Kadesh Barnea group. The ten that went back and gave the negative report and against the two that said, let's go by faith. And they said, no, let's go by sight. So I think this is pretty much what we're talking about here in this passage is that, you know, we're, we're talking not about salvation of the saved, but the potential salvation of someone who might be fooled into thinking that they're saved. They might believe that association gets them where they want to go. And he's saying no. He's saying no. The purpose of the Holy Spirit, remember. The purpose of the Holy Spirit, Jesus said this, when he comes, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and judgment concerning sin because they do not believe in me. You hear that? Because they do not believe in me. And of righteousness because I go to the Father. And I will no, no longer see you. Why is that? A, you know, that statement there is kind of puzzling. He's, uh, he's convicting the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Why is that? Why is that? Because Jesus goes back to the Father of that righteous. Who sees the Father? Only those who are righteous. If you want the way to God, you follow Jesus. You go his way. I am the way, the truth and the life. And then of judgment, because the ruler of this world has been judged. You know, at that moment, sin's no longer the issue. It's disbelief. The ruler, his day has been fixed. His destiny determined. His plan has succeeded. To tell us die, it is finished. All there is is the countdown to the end that remains. So I believe Weist is right about what's going on here. I, I remember Dr. Bennett saying something like this in one of his messages. He's got a book out called The Indispensable Role of the Holy Spirit. And I recommend it. And believe it or not, you can buy it on Amazon if you want to buy it. You can buy it, you know, at Barnes and Noble, wherever. But it's thirteen bucks. It's a great book for for being as little as it is. It's a great book to have. He said. He said this: man's need is not only for salvation but for power. Doctor Minnett said it like this: the greatest two needs man has is for pardon and power. Actually, he turned it around. He said power and pardon. Man has his two greatest needs are for power and pardon. Well, pardon is pretty simple to understand, right? The forgiveness of sin, right? To, to, to be reconciled to God through Jesus Christ's work. But what about this word power? I think it's what the writer of Hebrews is talking here. To be enlightened and then to have the taste of the heavenly gift. To be able to have your eyes open to the truth of the gospel. That's the power. That allows pardon to come. That's what Dr. Bennett was talking about there. And I think that's what the reader is talking about here. He's one of the. He's one of the. Uh, uh, he's warning these people. That are at this place. Of indecision. Uh, these, he's warning these people that are at this place of presumption. They're presuming that they're in the boat. Because they're in the crowd. That's not cr correct. Last comment and we'll close. MacArthur says. One of the pre-salvation ministries of the Holy Spirit is giving the unsaved a taste of the blessing of salvation. Notice that he uses the word taste. This is a part of his ministry of drawing men to Christ. There we are back to John 6, 44 again. But tasting is not eating. Tasting is not partaking. The Holy Spirit will give us a taste. <laughs> it says, but he will not make us one, meaning one with him, okay, but this is a pre-salvation ministry. He gives you a taste. This is part of his ministry of drawing men to Christ. But tasting is not eating. Again, I'll say that. The Holy Spirit will, not, will give us a taste. Just like he did the Jews. He says, but he will not make us eat. He will not make us make that decision. He says, the tasting came from what they had heard. 
as many today seen the transforming power of Christ and hear or have heard the gospel. God placed the blessing of salvation to the lips of the New Testament Jews, but they had not yet eaten. Remember all the ones that refused to set, accept Jesus? It says, tasting came from what they saw and heard, as many today see the transforming power of Christ and hear the gospel, yet do not receive. So I think that's what we're talking about here in this particular passage. So, any thoughts or questions? Well, let's go, let's go through verb tenses and uh, sentence diagrams now. My wife's going, Rrr. Now, this has, been, this has been tough, probably for you, but it's not been easy for me. So to, to get your head wrapped around something it isn't the easiest. So the bottom line here is that this passage doesn't refer to Christians, but it for, refers to non-Christians. It could be of those who are presuming that being associated with Christians is the same as being a Christian. And it also could be ones that are just oblivious to making a decision. And so just consider... Uh, those two options in that regard. All right. Any questions? Eric mentioned that, you know, the time between the writing and the reception of the first hearers of this letter is certainly a factor of simplicity to understanding what's going on. As time goes away, you know, we experience that in our nation right now when it comes to the reading and, and comprehension of what the intent of the writers of the Constitution of the United States is, right? And so we want to assign new meanings to the words the meanings that fit our vernacular and our understanding and without understanding exactly who these men were and the context in which they wrote and the definitional use of the words in the period to which they were put on paper. And so what we've done tonight, though it might be painful looking at the individual words, they have to be looked at and how the author would have understood them to mean and communicate meaning to his audience. And because his audience was relatively close to the time of these words being used in their vernacular, which would have been Greek in this time, they would have understood more easily what was being communicated in the nuance of the words as compared to us today, 2,000 years later. And so whenever, and I'll be honest with you, much of the stuff that you're learning, I'm learning with you. Because I didn't go into the deep word study of the sentence structure, or semantics and syntax, and understand these verbs are this and these verbs are that, and this word had this meaning, which, you know, added, you know, we went from a box of eight Crayola crayons to a box of 64 all of a sudden with the, you know, the depth of the richness of the meanings of the words. And so um, don't think that this is just something that, you know, either just popped in my head. No, it didn't. Or something that, you know, you should know just because you call yourself a Christian. This is part of Bible study. That's all it is. It's just study. So the richness of this is, is that when you, when you go wherever, you know, you, you'll look at your Bible and, and, and you'll, have, you'll have colors and writing all in it and stuff like that. And you'll have meanings and words and you'll have something new. And the next time that you go to talk to somebody... And, and they have a, this idea of eternal security being questioned in Hebrews, you're going to have these things back there. You might not think that you, you, do, you don't, you know, that you will have it, but it'll be back there. And you'll be able to ask questions. You know, it's just like Eric asked a question today about John 15. And I, and I did my best not to tell him what I thought. 
but I asked him questions that I thought would lead him into a thought process that would help him answer the question for himself. And that's what you can best do when somebody you're interfacing with out there, particularly if they're a non-believer and they're hostile toward Christianity. Start with asking them, why are you so hostile <laughs> toward Christianity rather than trying to win them to Jesus? And that'll, that'll show them that you really care about who they are as a person. Then you can get them you know, to say things like, well, there's all these contradictions in the Bible. Okay, show me one. Let's talk about it. And then when they, they, they start to run out of, you know, well, I don't have it. Oh, you don't even own a Bible. Okay, I understand. So you got those contradictions from, you know, and so, okay. Well, let's just talk about the things that are crystal clear in the Bible. All men are sinners. Is that debatable? Well, for some people it might be, but I think if we just look at the preponderance of crime in, in the world, we can say that pretty much everybody is at their own little sin factory. You know, call it whatever you want. Lawbreaker, you know, rebel. Wouldn't you agree, you know? And when they begin to agree, you know, then you've got another point of contact to begin a deeper discussion. So, anyway, sorry, sorry to go on to that rabbit trail. All right, our prayer list... Um, tonight any additions on our prayer list we need to make I know that we're still praying for Miss Debbie as she continues to go through and the governor's new direction on all people in school will have an effect on a lot of a lot of school districts uh, whether they do it or they don't but pray for Debbie and that I think if I think if I remember her conversation correctly she would prefer to have them in one place or the other, but having them in two places is more work than it seems to be even possible to begin to think about doing. So maybe, maybe it might make it a little simpler for her to have them all in the same place. And Debbie had her stress test times two today, and so she's obviously okay. So thank you for your prayers. You might, might have better prayed for me a little bit more. Um, anything else we need to mention? No? Okay. Well, let's just pray. Um, I understand there's lots of things going on in Washington these days. Let's not forget to pray for the administration and how they conduct the business of the country and, and in, our, in our daily affairs. I wrote a big long letter today to all the, the, the folks and probably get no response back from it, but oh well. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that we do live in this nation. As messed up as it is, it's still the greatest nation on earth. I've been around to many nations and seen far worse than what this is here. So, Lord, let us not just look so critically at one another and forget the blessings that you've given us in this nation each and every day. And let us esteem and hold up our president and our congressmen and our senators. And let us lift them up to you, Lord, that the light... Lord, would it certainly enlighten them, Lord, and that they would taste of the heavenly gift, Lord, that they would follow you with all of their heart, Lord, even if it costs them uh, their seat in the Senate or House of Representatives or even, Lord, a position in the government, Lord. May you uh, reign supreme in our lives. Lord, for us, may we uh, be partakers of that light and be salt wherever we are at, Lord, and that you would be lifted up. Lord, we think of those that are sick, Lord, tonight. Uh, we think about Edna and her eyesight, Lord, and the other issues with her. And we think about Meg and the cancer, Lord, that she is persisting against even now. We thank you for the good report, uh, Lord, of uh, just a, a successful test today for my wife, Debbie. Lord, there's so many other things going on, Lord, that you're not unaware. Lord, will you send us a word? Give us an encouragement this day, this week. Lord, that you're there, that you're aware, and that you love us. Lord, it might be a call, it might be a card, it might be a, you know, a text message. But Lord, encourage us, Lord, through your servants. We are your body, we are your hands and feet. Lord, as Isaiah said, here am I, send us. Lord, and I pray in Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>